Hey everybody, I'm Ken Brandt and I'm an artist. So this video that I'm about to show you, uh, it comes with a sad story. I did this portrait and this portrait is of my best friend, Tim Zimmerman, and he passed away in February. And it's been a tough, a tough couple months uh, because of that uh, for myself, uh, especially for his family. And I did this portrait not because someone asked me to, it was because I needed to do it. Um, this portrait, doing the painting this portrait really helped me through the process of his loss because, um, I mean, this, this guy, we, we grew up together and uh, we, we spent a lot of time with each other and um, he's going to be sorely missed. So, uh, in the process of painting this, it, it's helped me. And um, I wanted to share that process with you. So, uh, I, I would like you to sit back and enjoy and watch this process. I do explain a few things while I'm painting it. Um, and uh, at the end of the video, I do mention that I will be uh, uh, doing a portrait in the future and uh, we'll break that down and uh, we'll do it in parts and I'll show you my process and how I paint a portrait. So um, again, uh, thank you for watching. I started this portrait doing something different that I have never done before. You can see the drawing I did on the canvas and I normally just draw a quick outline on my subject on the canvas and then start painting it on it but this time I drew in all the shading and highlights much like I would for a drawing that I would put in one of my sketchbooks. Then I used some clear gesso and brushed over it sealing my drawing on to the canvas. My thinking was that if I made a mistake while painting I could simply wipe it off and my drawing would still be intact underneath and I could start over. My next decision was whether or not to start painting over the drawing using color or should I do a Grisale underpainting. I decided the underpainting was the best way to go because I could then set up all my values before applying color. This is what I'm doing here. I went with raw umber and titanium white. The raw umber um, straight from the tube was going to be my darkest dark and of course I would just keep mixing in white as I progressed to the lighter values. With the drawing underneath as a guide, it was relatively easy to see where I needed to place my dark and light values as I painted. Sometimes I will print my reference photo in black and white to help me decide where my dark and light values should be, but I found that this wasn't even necessary having the drawing already doing that for me. I really like this approach and have decided that this will be the way I will paint all my portraits from now on until I find something better. I highly encourage anyone to always be willing to try new and different things with your art because it could be the difference between staying stuck in the same place you always are or possibly creating the best painting you've ever painted. If what you try didn't work, then so what? You tried something, you learned something, and you're ready to move on. You just take what you learned and use it in your next painting. At first I was afraid to do that, uh, but now I don't even think twice about it. I look at it this way. Canvases are cheap. Let's say you pay $8 for a canvas. And after you paint on it, you may use like $4 worth of paint on it after it's all said and done. So $12. Theoretically, it costs me $12 to do a painting. If it didn't work out, I really, it really only costs me $4 because I could always paint over the canvas again. But let's say you tried something different and the results were good and you took what you learned from that painting and applied it to the next painting and that next painting became the one that got accepted into a juried show or got you an invitation to show in a local gallery or maybe it was a painting that someone with some sort of influence in the art world just happened to see and discovers you like Andy Warhol was. Was that theoretical $12 worth it? Now let's say you never tried anything new and keep painting with your bad habits and boring composition because you're afraid to wipe the canvas off and start over or think that this one is going to be your masterpiece. Now you have 50 paintings laying around your studio that may not be that good and they all look the same and theoretically you spent $12 a piece painting them 
multiply that by 50, that equals $600. You spent $600 to be the same boring painter when you could have spent much less becoming the next great painter, selling your next painting for a couple thousand. Look, the math doesn't lie. Um, so I, I highly encourage any artist to experiment and try. So I was painting this portrait of my friend Tim and I knew that I wanted the left side of the background to be dark and the right side to be lighter in value. The reference photo that I was using this, for this painting was not like that at all. It was just one plain color. The background in the photo was just one shade, no contrast. I knew I needed some contrast to make this painting more interesting and, when, uh, and I went with the classic approach of using dark background against the side of the face that was lighter and a light background against the side of the face that was more in the shape. This will always make for a more interesting portrait. I also knew that his hair, his dark hair, would blend into the dark background which would allow me some soft edges, and uh, which is what I wanted and some opportunity to add some lighter areas within the dark background to help push um, pushed him more into the background so it wouldn't look like he was a cutout sitting on top of the background. I had to keep this in mind as I, as you know, as I progressed with the painting. I started applying the flesh tones to the face, and for this, I used a mixture of pale yellow green and alizarin crimson. I first used equal amounts of each, mixed them together, and then used that mixture to make separate mixes of light and dark flesh values. The dark flesh values here uh, were my phthalo and alizarin mix with raw umber, a surprising amount of raw umber. You don't realize just how dark the shaded area of someone's skin really is until you make a mixture and you think it is the right color and then hold it against your reference and you see how close you are. I'm placing all the mixes of the different values in the areas I want them in and it looks like a patchwork of colors but after they're, they're there and I want them uh, where I want them, I blend them together for a real nice effect. This is my first layer of flesh tone and on this portrait I actually paint on three layers. Do I always use three layers? No. Sometimes it's more, but rarely would it be less. I'm not an impasto painter, so my layers are not that thick. Usually three gives me the desired look I'm looking for. I decided to save the eyes until after I had most of the face painted in because, well, honestly, I was a bit nervous jumping right into doing them. The eyes are the key to any portrait. As long as you capture the eyes perfectly, you could get the rest of the face completely wrong and it will still look like the person you're trying to paint. This was an important painting for me, so I knew they had to be perfect. And like anybody else, I wanted to get it right the first time. There is absolutely no doubt that Tim was guiding me through this painting, because as I started on the eyes, I felt relaxed and confident in the decision I was making on the placement of my paint. Once I had the eyes filled in, my friend was looking back at me. A friend I miss very much. I knew I'd captured his essence and I was very happy with how this portrait was going. For anybody doing a portrait for the first time, one thing to remember is that the whites of the eyes are not white. I actually used some of the flesh tone and I grayed it down a little with some Payne's Gray. If you paint white in the eyes for your portrait, your portrait will look very strange and everyone will comment on how the eyes are going to glow, or you know, how the eyes are glowing like you had a light behind the painting. Uh, I speak from experience on this one. So next I started working on the nose, getting the highlights where they needed to be, and making sure the nostrils were properly sized. Even though I had a drawing and underpainting to guide me, uh, a lot of these features were, um, they get distorted by overlapping layers and blending. I knew I had to remember to go back and look at these areas to make sure they looked right. I keep a mirror on the wall behind me and I can look at the painting in the mirror and usually anything that I don't see while I'm working on the painting, I'll catch in the reflection. It is a trick that was used by the old masters, and I will confirm that this works great on any painting. This helped me fix errors on my still lifes and pretty much any painting I've worked on. I highly recommend the use of this tool.
So one thing to note when doing a portrait is the ears. Yes, the ears are important as well, you know, as we all have them and your portrait will need them, but they don't require the attention that most people think they do. Be sure to paint them so they look correct, but they don't need to be painted with any detail. The main focus will always be in the eyes, and the ears will be in the viewer's peripheral vision, so the ears will be blurry or almost non-existent to the viewer. Um, if someone stares at the painting for any length of time and starts to look around the rest of the portrait, well, then they will see some ears, but they won't be you know, with sharp and crisp edges. It, it's just not necessary. So here you can see where I'm filling in the background with the dark value on the left and the lighter value on the right. I went with some raw umber, ultramarine blue, and some paints gray for the background. Um, I knew that the light and dark values would make a good contrast, so I wasn't concerned with using certain colors to make the background interesting. So once I had the ears and the lips finished and was very happy with uh, his hair and beard and mustache, I was ready to move on to his shirt. For the shirt, it was just an ultramarine blue and raw umber mixed together, and the lighter areas were ultramarine blue and titanium white. I didn't have any material folds to contend with so on this painting, so it was pretty straightforward. Again, the since the main focal point is Tim's eyes, his shirt does not require a lot of detail. Yes, it should be painted in a way that it doesn't appear flat or two-dimensional, but it doesn't require any sharp edges or line detail either. So here I started applying the third and final layer of skin tone. At the time I was painting this portrait, I wasn't sure that this would be the final layer. But I was extremely happy with the look after this layer was applied and decided that this was good. This was, you know, where I needed to be. At this point, the portrait almost painted itself. I just went over a few areas and filled in some spots and blended some colors, and it was done. All in all, this painting took me approximately nine hours to complete. I didn't do it all in one nine hour sitting. I don't think that would have been possible with the Grisail underpainting. Um, that had to dry before applying the color over the top of the, you know, uh, top of the Grisail. But if I had done it in one sitting, then yes, nine hours is how long it would have taken. Since Tim's passing, he's in my thoughts every day. But they're just the memories I have of him and the thought of of all the what ifs. Doing this painting gave me some comfort uh, from the grief I have in my heart. While painting it, it was like my friend was with me and it was nice to think about Tim in that moment as I created something new instead of rehashing a memory from the past. As long as this painting exists, it is as if Tim is here now and I don't miss him as bad. It's actually kind of nice. This is one of the reasons I'm glad I do what I do.
in the future I do plan on doing some videos of uh, how I actually paint a portrait and it'll be a lot more in detail. I'll, it won't be a time lapse. I'll do it in parts um, and that way you can see uh, exactly how I apply uh, each layer onto the canvas. I think this is important just to see how someone else uh, does you know their painting it's not necessarily the way you would do your painting but it's always good to see how other techniques work and this and then you can take that technique and put it in your arsenal of, of things to do when you paint a painting and so it's always good to you know have an idea in your head or see how someone else actually performs that idea and paints it on the canvas so that way you could play around with it and see if it works for you so yeah, I'm going to do uh, uh, some videos of a uh, portrait and we will uh, slow it down, I'll take my time, we'll uh, go over it, and uh, that way you can see how I do it. So here is where I'm blending in the hairline so it doesn't look like he has a wig sitting on top of his head. I wanted to make sure that the flesh tone and the hair color blended together uh, so it looked more realistic. Applied some final details to the mustache and beard. I was extremely happy with the uh, color of the skin on that third layer. It was a beautiful, deep, deep colorization on his skin that I really, I really thought worked out really well. So I appreciate everyone watching this video and um, I hope you enjoyed watching uh, how I painted this. I definitely I needed to paint this. I enjoyed painting this and I'm glad you were with me while I did this. And uh, if you like this video, uh, make sure you give it a like. Um, if you like what you're seeing and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe. And uh, definitely uh, if you have any ideas of anything that you want to see in the future, uh, leave them below in the comments. and. Um, We'll definitely try to do that. So thank, again, thank you, and until the next video, bye.